So welcome everyone. I'm Thomas Sir. I'm the CEO of Kinexum. Uh, we're delighted to have you join the fifth edition of the annual WOW or YOW webinar. Uh, we have a chock-a-block uh, set of topics to cover, so I'll just remind everyone to enter your questions in the chat box or column, and the panel will get, it, get to as many as they have time for. Uh, just to warm up the chat function, those of you who are willing, please uh, say hi in the chat and from where you are logging in. Uh, a recording of this webcast will be posted over the weekend, and a transcript will follow. And I'll now turn the mic over to our moderator, Dr. Zan Fleming, Connexum founder and FDA alumnus. Zan? Thank you, Thomas. And it's wonderful to see this global audience and uh, what fun we are going to have. We do have our work cut out for us, uh, sort of comparable to Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. We're going to do Around the Major Centers of FDA in 90 Minutes. And this is obviously going to be tough to, uh, to, to bring off, but I, I think we've got a panel that can do it. And we look forward not only to this discussion, but to your questions and to the extent possible, your active uh, participation. So without further ado, I'm going to ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. This will give you a chance to put a picture to the bio that you can also read uh, in more detail. But let's start first with uh, Minnie, Minnie Baylor Henry. Hi, good, uh, good morning. I'm Minnie Baylor Henry. I'm the president of B. Henry and Associates, um, a consulting firm. Uh, prior to B. Henry and Associates, I was worldwide vice president of regulatory affairs for Johnson & Johnson Medical Devices. Previously, I was the director of the Division of Drug Marketing, Advertising, and Communications at FDA former president and chair of the board of DIA and chair of the board of FDLI. Thanks, many. And over to Dave Fox. Thanks, Ann. Uh, I'm Dave Fox. I'm a partner at uh, Hogan Lovells. We're a global behemoth of a law firm with a nice little FDA practice. Um, we, we actually have a practice that's about the, the largest uh, outside of the office of the chief counsel at FDA. Um, <laughs> And that's where I started my FDA career in the early 1990s, where I was counsel to the Center for Drugs, and I was occasional counsel to Zan Fleming and his group, <laughs> Metabolic and Endocrine Drug Products, whatever that's worth. Thanks, Zan. Uh, thank you, Dave. And over to Tim Franson. Yeah, good day, all. Tim Franson here. I'm an infectious disease physician and pharmacist by training, and currently a principal at Fagri Drinker Consulting. And I formerly served as the Global Vice President for Regulatory Affairs and Drug Safety at Eli Lilly, and also past president at the US Pharmacopeia and immediate past board chair at Critical Path Institute. So delighted to see you all. Thanks, Tim. And over to Dave's colleague at Hogan, Karen Moore. Actually, I'm with Hyman Phelps and McNamara. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Frank. <laughs> Whoa. What I am Frank's colleague. Frank. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, good morning, we everyone. Love, we'd love to have you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have her, Dave. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Karen Moore. And as you've all just learned, I am uh, with work with Frank Sasnowski at Hyman Phelps and McNamara, where I focus on the F of the FDA on the food side. Uh, and before joining Hyman Phelps, uh, which occurred about six weeks before the pandemic hit, I was the general counsel of the Grocery Manufacturers Association, now known as the Consumer Brands Association. And before that, a lot of years in antitrust at the FTC and at law firms. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. Great to be covering the F and FDA. And important to remember that uh, the D part came out of Department of Agriculture and is still part of the uh, Agriculture Appropriation. Appropriation. Mm -hmm. How about that? Kellyanne Payne, over to you. I am, hi, my name is Kellyanne Payne. I am Dave's uh, colleague at Hogan Levels. Um, I am a partner in the FDA Medical Devices Group at Hogan Levels. I've been at the firm for about, going on 17 years. Um, prior to that, I was a consultant for the device industry at, at uh, consulting firms such as the Weinberg Group and Becker and & Associates. And I did serve as in-house counsel for QVC for a year, reviewing all their like FDA, FTC regulated products. So nice to be here. 
Great to have you, Kellyanne. And then to Kate. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm Kate Rawson. I'm a senior editor at Provision Policy, which is a continuous news service for um, the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, I cover the F, uh, the D, sorry, not the F, the D um, in, uh, at FDA uh, with a specific focus on, um, on FDA itself and, and drugs and biologics. Um, prior to um, helping to, to found provision policy, I worked at the Pink Sheet and its related um, publications for about 10 years. And then to brother Frank Sasanowski of Hogan, no. <laughs> uh, you keep trying, Zan. <laughs> Dave and I love each other, but like brothers, but uh, but but we're not quite one firm yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Frank Sasanowski, I'm a I'm a director at Hyman Fels McNamara. Uh, I'm vice chair of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. I'm an adjunct professor of neurology at the University of Rochester Med School. Uh, when I was at FDA in the 80s, I helped uh, create the Accelerated Approval Program, and I helped implement the Orphan Drug Act. Amazing stuff. What an incredible panel. I think everybody will agree. Let's go to our traditional year in review of key approvals. Typically, Dave has done that, and we'll start with Dave, but this year we're going to get to CEDAR and uh, certainly uh, CDRH, and a little of CIFSAN. So David, go right ahead. Th th thanks, Ann. So um, the, the year in review for 2021, what, what a long, strange year it was. We can say, I, I, I was thinking back to when two senior FDA vaccine officials resigned in protest last fall over a quarrel about the rush to roll out boosters. And that seems like ages ago and, and probably something of a yow in, in hindsight, um, but I'll, I'll do my best to quiet my overactive COVID mind and focus on what I know is everyone's true passion, which is the business and art of regulation and most important uh, new product approvals. So the machinery rolled on in 2021 with CEDAR scoring 50 approvals of novel drugs and biologics, uh, a number we now have almost taken for granted Although I would say if you follow the news, you'd think there was only one approval in 2021 at Helen, which I think we'll be talking quite a bit about. Um, on that one, three advisory committee members resigned in protest over the approval, which you don't see very often or ever. And so we'll score that as another yow for 2021. And then speaking of advisory committees, uh, I just wanted to note that we had uh, by, by most counts only 11 cedar led NDA meetings in 2021. And I was thinking back to the good old days when sometimes we had three or four ad comms in a month um, and record numbers up to 50 a year. And I'd say that 2021, if you look at all that happened at the ad com level was probably the year that the ad com process for cedar lost its mojo. So a, a third yow in a row. Uh, but here we are in 2022 and Janet Woodcock is somehow still the acting commissioner of FDA. And so that has to be a wow. Um, and so on to the, to the real wow, the, the 50 approvals. Uh, very quickly, one out of two were or orphans, one out of three were oncology drugs, and one out of four were under Frank's accelerated approval program. So that's a, a lot of work on products that fall within a fairly narrow bandwidth. Uh, just saying, for those who, who, who focus on where FDA is putting, putting its resources. Um, very interesting, seven of the 50 approvals were for monoclonal antibodies, although five were turned down. Um, most interesting, uh, at least, uh, uh, or, or to me, most relatable, were GSK's Nucala, a monoclonal antibody for chronic rhinositis with nasal polyps, and Leo Pharma's Adbury, a monoclonal for atopic dermatitis for those who can't be treated topically. Uh, so this shows the phenomenal reach of that monoclonal class. And then just one last in this class that I'll note, I always like to, to note for personal reasons, the lupus approvals. There were two lupus approvals. One of them, Safnella, was a monoclonal and uh, it made it over the finish line despite uh, a few, depending on how you Look at it, a few failed studies. And I know there's a, a lot of people in this audience who track those kinds of things. So I'd point that one out. 
Um, the red hot area were kinase inhibitors, nine, at least nine kinase inhibitor approvals, mostly in and around oncology. Uh, in, and everyone has their favorite. I'll pick out Cadman's Resurock for graft versus host disease. It targets the ROC2 signaling pathway. I have no idea what that means, but it sounds cool, ROC2. So we'll have to give that one a, a wow for 2021. And then among the glitzier approvals, not counting COVID products, oncology products, and some strange neurology approvals, um, I'll focus on uh, Novartis and Alnylam's Lecfeo and Clisaran to lower LDL cholesterol in certain patients. Um, this is another drug uh, in, in another red hot field, the, the RNA interference or SI RNA class. Um, several, uh, not SI RNA products, but antibody products have been going after the same target that Lecvio goes after. But Lecvio's trick is it can be dosed just twice a year. And uh, I have to say that dosing convenience and compliance need way more attention in drug development, in my view, especially in chronic disease categories like cholesterol lowering, type 2 diabetes, um, what have you. So let's hope this one proves to be a wow. Uh, last, I, I know, again, everyone has their favorites in the class of 2021. It depends on which therapeutic areas are meaningful to you, which modalities are meaningful to you. So I'm going to narrow things down to what I'll say are the, the, the three nerdiest approvals for 2021. These are, this is for the real regulatory geeks out there. Apologies. So first is Recorlev, uh, levoketoconazole for Cushing syndrome. Um, it's a single enantiomer of a previously approved racemic mixture, ordinary ketoconazole. Now, just, just, just so you don't get confused, you won't find this one on the list of new molecular entities approved in 2021. It's not technically a new molecular entity, because the enantiomer was previously approved as part of the racemic mixture. But it's an interesting kind of a unicorn. It's a, it was developed for an entirely different use than the original racemic mixture. And it may be eligible for what we call statutory new chemical entity exclusivity um, uh, under a special provision for this, this very kind of you know, trick of chiral chemistry. It's only happened once before uh, for trivia buffs. It was Fetsima in 2013. Um, so we'll be watching that one. Uh, second is Alkermes's uh, Libalvi, uh, which takes a well-known drug, olanzapine, and combines it with a novel drug, a new, a, a new molecular entity, Samidorphin. So I, we probably all know olanzapine. It's a you know, well-known drug, great drug for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but it comes with clinically significant treatment-limiting weight gain particularly a lot of adolescents won't take it because of weight gain, which is, which is unfortunate. So Alchemy has obtained approval for a combination of the old elanzapine and the new samidorphin, with samidorphin being used to mitigate the weight gain effect or side effect from elanzapine. So this is a pretty neat trick and another very, very rare regulatory feat, getting a, a novel agent to mitigate the side effect of a previously approved drug. And then, and then third, <clears throat> I'll point out on, on targets, Cytalix, which is a targeted fluorescing imaging agent that helps surgeons uh, identify tissue during uh, uh, surgery for ovarian cancer. Uh, I think it was the only imaging agent approved in 2021, but, but more important is when it was approved. It was approved after the agency began its implementation of the genus medical case, which we're gonna be discussing later in the program. Um, and that's significant because in the field of tissue selective and targeted imaging agents, I think it was reassuring to see the agency's commitment to continue approving these products as drugs rather than as devices, which is where things are headed with the genus medical case, at least for certain types of imaging agents, but not this one, uh, which again was reassuring. A few more notables for 2021, 91st generic approvals, impressive. Four more biosimilar approvals, and we now have 33 total biosimilar approvals, including, and this is a, a milestone moment, two interchangeable uh, biosimilars, one, one against uh, Lantus, insul insulin glargine, and one against Umira, adalimumab. <clears throat> we also had 13 CBA approvals. Uh, obviously, everybody's following the COVID vaccines, and then the first three RMAT-designated uh, approvals. This is for regenerative medicines, and I know Frank is going to 
talk about that. And these are all huge wows. Uh, finally, it was not all fun. <clears throat> in 2021, uh, we saw a, a very high number of complete response letters, 18 in total for novel drugs and biologics. Um, and if you took the, uh, the period from when we, we more or less began the pandemic, March 2020 through to September 2021, so about an 18 month period, at, at least 60 applications had their action dates delayed because the agency couldn't find a way to safely conduct an inspection, real or virtual. And that, that's a yell, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue that has to be worked, is, is being worked through the system, but, but a, you know, a, a real sticking point for the industry. And that's a lot to take in. And, and as always, it just scratches the surface. So all in all, a standout year <clears throat> under what we all have to agree were very tough circumstances for the agency with just one or two epic yows, which we'll talk about in the program. And so now on to my uh, friend and brother, uh, uh, the peerless uh, Frank Sazanowski. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Uh, there, I, I just want to just comment on a, a few of those that, as Dave mentioned, I was going to talk about in terms of the RMAT. You know, were the first three RMATs. RMAT was created under the 21st Century Cures Act, one of the last pieces of legislation signed by President Obama, December 2016. And, and it's good to see this has finally come to fruition, that the first three products, uh, one was uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb CAR-T therapy, and then there were two cell therapies, and that's really significant, Stratigraph for burns, and then rythemic for a, a thymus condition. I was particularly focusing on the two cell therapies because cell therapy, there was a report that came out of the University of California, Irvine, about several months ago. I sent it to Peter Marks and Wilson Bryan saying that there was something like 1,500 or, or more um, stem cell clinics around the country. You know, of course, none of those are approved. Uh, so there are 1,100 INDs for cell therapies active. And so it's really heartening to see the first two cell therapies, you know, make it through OTAT to get to approval. So uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later on in the context of gene therapy and contrast both. And what I'll say, that so the wow for 2021 in the world of OTAT, besides all the work on COVID vaccines, the wow is the first two cell therapies. And, and it's very difficult to get a cell therapy because think about that. In a cell therapy to get a BLA, you have to show a potency assay. And, and when you're talking about a cell therapy, usually there's such pleiotrophic effects that it's difficult to figure out what is the one mechanism or a matrix of mechanisms for which you are going to attribute the activity, the therapeutic benefit, because you have to be able to identify that and prove that any future lots of your material are going to contain, you know, the the aspect of that product that is going to uh, uh, confer the benefit to patients. So it's much trickier than in the world of synthetic fine chemicals, much trickier than the world of gene therapies. So it's very unique to cell therapies. And so that's why there's all this tremendous industry out there, very a lot of excitement within the scientific community uh, and also within the investment community but it's very heartening to me to see that we've got the first two that have made it through the wicket. And it, it, that, so that's a great wow for, for CBER for 2021. But the yow is that I helped on the last systemic gene therapy to get approved. And that was the approval in 2019 of, uh, of Exus's Zolgemza for spinal muscular atrophy. So we haven't had another gene therapy. There's 1,200 INDs active on gene therapies. There's certainly a lot of activity, but we haven't had another approval uh, for a gene therapy. So that's the that's the uh, yow uh, out of that. Turning it back to you, Zan. Well, terrific. Hey, 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 Frank, Frank and Zan, I, I just 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 one one other capstone to what Frank said about the stem cell products. Uh, again, for those who keep track of these things, FDA had a really tough year in court this year. They lost. Uh, two significant circuit court decisions, but they did win one a case in the 11th circuit, the U.S. stem cell case, where they shut down a stem cell clinic and, and, and I think created some very good law, very good enforcement law for the agency yeah. to, to have the rogue stem cell uh, clinics brought under FDA supervision. Um, so I think, I think that's, you know, for those who track the, the, the agency's legal 
successes and failures, that was definitely a, a, a positive for the agency and a positive overall, I think, for bringing stem cells through the, the front door at FDA. Brilliant, Frank and David. Let's go on to CDRH with uh, Kellyanne uh, and many. So on the device side, I, you know, I can't give exact numbers like, like Dave. I think there's a lot of 510Ks, de novos, PMAs, supplements, HDEs um, that, that got approved this past year in 2021. Um, I will note a few examples of, of ones, and you can see where FDA has been pretty active. So the BioFire um, COVID test got a de novo approval, which meant that it was the first COVID, the first and only at this point, COVID test that went from an EUA authorization to a full marketing authorization. And that's a wow, and it's significant because it set the special controls and the precedent for a lot of uh, tests that will become after that, that will have to transition from EUA to full marketing authorization um, if they want to stay on the market in the future. Um, so that's a definite wow. Um, in the world of de novos, there was also the Ease VRX um, that got granted through FDA, and that's a virtual reality device for chronic pain treatment. Um, and that's pretty significant. FDA has been putting focus on, you know, devices to treat pain in light of the opioid crisis in this country. Uh, so it, it was a real significant wow, especially in the de novo space. And we're seeing more and more de novos in the, the neurological space um, for various types of treatments, for ADHD, for uh, pain, for uh, all types of conditions, insomnia, things like that. So real digital health focus in that space. Um, also, this past year, there was an HDE granted for a 3D printed total, um, total talus for ankle for um, avular necrosis of the ankle, and it's a patient-specific 3D printed product. Um, they, bought, they recently just got a supplement within the year of their initial approval, um, so it could be printed in different materials. And what was great about that is it's an HDE, it required a site inspection, and that was all able to be done during the pandemic you know, remotely and, and, and in other ways with proper documentation. So that was a big wow for the agency to be able to get that through in a pandemic, you know, looking through all the inspection materials that were required for that. Um, so there are a few uh, that, that were on my list. There's another one for orthospace. They got their um, shoulder implant in through a de novo, which is an orthopedic uh, tissue spacer balloon. And that's significant because for a while we were not seeing de novos in the orthopedic space. Uh, there tend to be a tension at one point between kind of low to moderate risk requirements and orthopedic products, but now we are seeing more and more de novos in that space. So there are just a few of the examples of the ones, you know, that were relevant, you know, that we may have, you know, worked on or seen in the past year to give some, some updates. Um, and then in the 15 k space, I think, you know, I'm seeing a lot of things go through. I am seeing delays in certain, you know, aspects and divisions of FDA, and so there are some delays um, depending on where your submission is and, and what it's intended for. So, so many, I'll let you follow up with that. Thanks, Kellyanne, yeah. uh, and and leave it to many to start on a yow, um, but but I will start on a yow um, just to follow up on what Kellyanne said about the delays. Um, there, there in 2021, there were 71 510K submissions that missed performance goals. And so it's, it's important um, to note that. And as Kellyanne said, these were really, uh, for the most part, targeted to, to three offices, obviously in vitro diagnostics, um, the, this, the group that has responsibility for surgical and infection control, and then the last group is the Office of Ophthalmic Anesthesia and Respiratory ENT and Dental Devices for obvious reasons because of ENT. And so COVID had uh, a huge impact on these uh, 510Ks and, and other uh, clearances and approvals. Um, the other thing that's of note in CDRH is um, the fact that the Q-subs um, are being impacted, so the request for meetings. And so the, a, a lot of the divisions, particularly the, the divisions that were noted, um, were having a difficulty in being able to schedule Q-subs and pre-sub meetings and those kinds of meetings that from an industry perspective are so important to try to get some direction as to, to where you should go with your potential submission. Um, so Dr. Shuren, about mid-2021, Dr. Shuren made a statement around the fact that, that there were these, these delays were anticipated. 
but expected that by the end of 2021, things would begin to return to normal. And there's still some delays, particularly in the, in the diagnostics group, but you're starting to see an improvement as, as Kellyanne said. And so then I'm gonna to transition to some wows uh, in reverse order, obviously. Um, so I think uh, there, were, there were lots of guidance documents from 2021, some very technical uh, for specific uh, therapeutic categories, but I'm gonna focus on some of the others that, that had a more broad sweeping impact. And so in January of 2021, uh, FDA, uh, issued a guidance on safer technologies program for medical devices or STEP. And, uh, and the significance of this is, this, as, um, as the agency will say, that part of its mission is to ensure the safety of products that it approves or clears for the, for the American people. And what STEP is, is attempting to do is to incentivize companies to do um, innovative things around safer medical devices. And these would be devices that where there's a reasonable expectation that the safety would of the that the safety would be improved um, as a result of this device. And so therefore uh, this device should be given some priority considerations. And while this doesn't meet these devices don't meet the threshold of breakthrough, they're still considered to be important in terms of the improvement in safety. Um, one of the other uh, interesting guidance documents from 2021 was one entitled uh, Digital Health Technologies for Remote Data Acquisition in Clinical Investigations, or it's focused on DHT, Digital Health Technology, um, which is the system that uses computing platforms, connectivity software, and so forth. Uh, for being able to use this in clinical studies and clinical trials. And this is important because the belief is that by using for like a tablet or your phone or your home computer, and to be able to participate in a clinical trial for a medical device using these types of technology, that you'll, you'll be able to touch um, a wider audience um, one of the things that you often hear in terms of the lack of diversity in clinical trials is the fact that there are barriers to individuals being able to come to clinical trial sites. Um, there are daycare problems. There are lots of problems. This was one way that CDRH viewed as being able to make a difference in terms of being able to attract a wider audience and, and to, to see whether or not that helps with the um, having a broader population in the device clinical trials. Obviously, the, the key is whether it's fit for the purpose, whether these different devices are, are sufficient to support uh, the intent behind the clinical study. Um, another, device, uh, another device guidance that I thought was interesting was this patient engagement in the design and conduct of medical device clinical trials, clinical studies, and, uh, and also principles for selecting and developing and modifying um, and, adopting, and adapting patient reported outcomes. And, well, and this, this may not seem as big a deal for those in the drug area, this is a big deal that for devices that it's 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 really reaching out and taking into account the importance of the patient's voice and the design of a, a medical device. And so there was a there was there were many uh, guidances that came out in 2021 that focused on the criticality of the patient's voice in um, in medical devices uh, clearances and approvals. Um, so, and then lest we forget that the, the digital health group is just on fire. Uh, they, they absolutely issued lots and lots of guidance documents that were so important uh, to the industry. And um, just to name a few, uh, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, uh, good machine learning practices for medical device development. Um, and one of the other things uh, that, that is happening in CDRH is that they've been training reviewers through what's known as the experiential learning program. And this was, this was not a new program. Experiential learning has been 
part of CDRH for a while now, as Kellyanne knows. Um, and so the this is this is where the uh, reviewers in CDRH actually get some hands-on experience with the medical devices, whether whether the device is brought to, to CDRH or the reviewers from CDRH actually go into the company and have an opportunity to, to touch and feel and, and, and learn can, exactly what it means. And so what the, this 2021 was expanding this into the digital health space with a focus on innovation and digital health. And so that, that's really an important area. And the, the industry certainly appreciates this experiential learning opportunity. Um, one, one comment um, before I turn it back to Zan, um, in the Health of the Women, Health of Women Plan, which actually came out in uh, the strategic plan, it came out in 2022. I think this is an area that we have to watch. So this is, um, let's, let's keep an eye on what this means. Hopefully this means that, that there will be a focus on the importance of looking at differentiating factors in medical device clinical trials between men and women. Um, this, is, this is not uh, a new initiative, but one that hasn't had as much attention. And so with the, with the focus on the voice of the patient, this becomes even more important. I mean, there are some who have written that it's important to look back and see kind of what products were approved in the past for women and whether or not they met the threshold of safety and effectiveness. But this, the, the guidelines going forward are focused on sort of forward looking as opposed to looking backwards. And then last but certainly not least, in December of 2021, the, the CDRH issued a guidance on um, emergency use authorization medical devices and encouraging companies that intend to stay in this space to begin thinking about registration and, and how they will uh, apply for a 510K or a PMA um, or de novo as appropriate. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Zan. Brava, that was wonderful, many, and Kellyanne, terrific summary or set of summaries from CD, CDRH. Can't thank you enough for that. Let's now go over to Karen, who will give us the analogous major uh, actions from the Center for Food and uh, Nutrition. Uh, what is it? Um, Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Yeah, yeah. I, I have yeah. to stop and think. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Zan. Um, so I'm going to hit on a couple high points or low points, depending on which side of the table you happen to be on. Um, one of the, the first things I want to touch on is that the uh, FDA finally issued the sodium final guidance. Uh, and this set voluntary short-term sodium reduction targets, um, seeking to uh, decrease the average sodium intake um, of, of adults from 3,400 milligrams to 3,000 milligrams per day over the next two years. Um, I would note that this still doesn't get, uh, get everyone to the level uh, that was recommended by the Dietary Guidelines for Americans of 2,300 milligrams. Uh, which was also what the draft guidance uh, recommended um, uh, when that came out a number of years ago. So um, it has been issued, they are voluntary, and um, I will say that uh, the food industry has been working uh, to decrease sodium for years now um, uh, with, with mixed success as you know, some people just don't like to buy the low sodium versions of foods. So um, there's that. Um, Next up, I think kind of gets a, a wow is in July of 2020, the FDA announced uh, this new era of food safety. And I think the wow parts are, are some of the things that, that they've been doing this year that, that may have flown under the radar a little bit. They're using predictive analytics, that they call 21 forward to help identify where there could be disruptions in the food supply due to work absences due to the pandemic. Uh, they're using artificial intelligence to predict uh, imp, uh, which imported foods pose the greatest risk of violations uh, and use that to better target their import resources. Um, uh, this also goes to kind of the remote inspections that have been occurring. Uh, and while there has certainly been resource constraints, that hasn't stopped um, FDA from uh, 
uh, conducting a record number of foreign supplier verification inspections uh, despite the pandemic. So those are things that, that I think flew a little bit under the radar, but definitely hit the wow, especially in the use of the technologies uh, that the FDA is turning to. Um, uh, something that FDA uh, focused on in their kind of look back over the year was a strengthening of maternal and infant health and nutrition. Uh, you all may remember rather alarmist uh, February 4th report that came out of the House Oversight Committee's Subcommittee on Economic and Consumer Policy, I had to read that, uh, that alleged dangerously high levels of heavy metals in leading baby food brands. Um, uh, and that may have spurred some action by FDA. However, what was left out of uh, a number of the reports was that the industry and FDA have been working on this for years. Um, and I have in my notes C, uh, 2016 draft guidance on arsenic in rice cereals. So this is something that, that uh, manufacturers are aware of that they've been working hand in hand with FDA on for years. Um, uh, FDA did a number of other things in this area this year. They issued a letter in March reminding uh, baby and toddler food manufacturers about GMPs, hazard analysis, preventative controls, which quite frankly, most of them knew about before. Uh, 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 but as um, the head of SIFSTAN's Office of Analytics and Outreach said, solutions to this issue of um, uh, heavy metals uh, that are uh, naturally occurring in the soil um, uh, must be science-based, can't be arbitrary, it can't be uh, capricious, and it has to be legal. And all of that takes a great deal of time, uh, as I think every person on this call probably knows. Um, they also had a workshop on bioactives and infant formula, um, and they released an action plan called Closer to Zero, setting forth their approach um, on that. Um, next up, I wanted to touch uh, briefly a little bit on uh, um, coordination. Uh, with other agencies, uh, um, uh, in particular, the FTC and DOJ, as Kellyanne uh, mentioned, she did a lot of that in the past. Um, and while the agencies have, uh, in the past, worked very closely together and shared a great deal of information, uh, since the onset of the pandemic, uh, there's been increasing use of jointly issued warning letters by the FTC and the FDA, um, uh, particularly the FTC's Division of Advertising Practices, um, uh, in the never-ending fight against fraudulent COVID-19 practices, you know, you name it, they've, they've issued, uh, it, it is in the high hundreds of uh, numbers of warning letters to companies at this stage if it hasn't ticked over a thousand. Um, and, and that cooperation is going beyond COVID uh, issues um, and includes multi-company sweeps, uh, which is an FTC term that they use to kind of go after uh, a number of industry participants at the same time, uh, targeting things like um, dietary supplements, claiming fraudulently that uh, they, they, they cure infertility and diabetes, and things like that. So um, I, I hope that that coordination continues and I have every reason to believe it does. As a former FTC staffer, it does my heart good uh, when federal agencies coordinate like that on issues. Uh, and bring their expertise together. Um, and then um, certainly last but not least, um, I just wanted to inject a little bit of humor into this. Um, as uh, The Guardian out of the UK said, the US government's tyrannical reign over a classic condiment is finally dying uh, or is finally ending. And that is uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the FDA finally responded to a citizen petition submitted in January of 1998. Yep, that was 24 years ago. Uh, and revoke the standard of identity for French dressing. Um, as a piece of trivia, uh, the standard of identity for French dressing dates back to 1950, so 70 plus years, when there were just three types of dressing that FDA uh, identified. And get this, the other two were mayonnaise and just plain salad dressing. Um, so uh, I know we're, we're short on time, so I'm just gonna flip it back to Zan and, and other things are gonna come out during uh, the rest of the discussion today. I love that, Karen. That, that's a great one. And we do have more fun ahead as our punster, master punster, Tim Franson, uh, leads a discussion on the uh, potentially incoming commissioner. So Tim, over to you. Thanks so much, Zan. And delighted to share not only comments about the incoming commissioner, but what implications he or other factors will have on the overall agenda of FDA moving forward. 
So as we think about uh, Dr. Califf and his candidacy, certainly the notion of having what may be the first returning letterman in uh, the commissioner ranks would be truly a, a, a wow and very positive. Having him quarterbacking, given his uh, depth of knowledge in uh, big data, in clinical trials and so forth would be incredibly advantageous. So double wow there. Uh, when we talk about looking at this morning's media, that uh, will he be confirmed? Does he have the support of the White House and so forth? Without diving too much into that, that's not a wow or yow, it's a holy cow, uh, beyond what Harry Carey would have said for you baseball fans. And it could be a disaster, considering that Dr. Woodcock cannot be renewed as acting commissioner, obviously a very similar distinguished record and understanding of FDA. And if not for those two, who would it be? But uh, let's go beyond that and talk about some of the issues that might be important that either Dr. Califf raised it to hearings or otherwise. I'll begin by saying that most changes in our environment are driven by crisis rather than data or thoughtful direction. And one can look back to the past with HIV, to the present with COVID, to the future with inspection trends and saying it is a bit convoluted and it, it, it uh, compels me to say that it's much like newborns where our regulatory practices need frequent changes, often for similar reasons. <laughs> so let's think about what those might be, highlighting only a couple topics. One, real world evidence, and then two, talking about accelerated approval. And I'll ask my colleagues, Kate and Frank, to address that. And then I'll just make a closing comment about COVID development. But for real world evidence, 30 seconds on it. We've obviously seen a lot there. Dr. Califf is very experienced from his Google Alphabet Verily type uh, background, as well as uh, at uh, DCRI, Duke Clinical Research Institute. I think the challenges that we need to watch for, so maybe not a wow or yow, but a how now, would be how do we capture data? How do we source data validate with uh, uh, real world data and evidence? And what is meant by fit for purpose, or perhaps turning that around. How do we target what's unfit for purpose? And can we use these for original NDAs versus uh, SNDAs, supplemental? Perhaps pilots in our rare disease areas would be something very exciting that many of our companies and colleagues could consider addressing. So I would think that it would be very important for the industry uh, to think about flexibility and predictability. With that, I'd like to invite comments initially by Kate and then by Frank talking about accelerated approval and the trade-off between oncology and other areas, how we might be thinking about some of the threats and opportunities. Kate? Great. Um, thanks so much, Tim. And, and thanks everyone for, uh, for inviting me um, in on this discussion this year. This is, this is really fun. Um, so just first to reflect before we, uh, I, I'll kick it over to Frank to, to kick off um, accelerated approval in a minute, but um, just to reflect a little bit, Tim, on what you said, you know, coming in, um, Rob Califf, should he be confirmed or whoever is the next commissioner will really be in a, a unique position in that they'll be able to redefine what a post-pandemic FDA is going to look like. So what is FDA going to keep as key lessons learned? Um, what will it set aside uh, for the next big crisis? Um, and that's everything from decentralized clinical trials to whether some employees can work uh, telework permanently. You know, you recall that White Oak has essentially been empty since March of 2020, except for lab workers. And at the same time, the agency has been incredibly efficient and productive with everyone working remotely. So you kind of start to wonder if it, if it ain't broke, why, why would we fix that? Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, a major continued challenge for um, Dr. Califf or whoever the next commissioner is going to be will be making FDA a cool place to work. Um, you know, the agency is going to need an infusion of new talent, both to keep up with this wave of retirements that we've seen and that will continue, um, but also to bring in new skills in areas like digital health or, or cell and, and gene therapy. You know, and the challenge is going to be attracting talent with salaries that are much lower than what the private sector can offer, even with um, some of the increased funding um, allowances that come under that came under 21st century cures. 
Um, and so, you know, and then just to um, just to step back a minute and sort of reflect on this crazy process that we've been witnessing now um, for uh, for the, the the past year or so. You know, each path to a commissioner is certainly different. This one has been unprecedented in a number of ways. Um, you know, from an outsider's perspective, it seems to me that this dragged out uh, process to a nomination. Um, really illustrates the lack of any point person in the White House on FDA issues. That's really unusual for a Democrat in the White House to not prioritize um, FDA commissioner um, that seat. Um, it's certainly clear that the administration was perfectly happy to let Janet Woodcock um, run the show until the clock ran down. And, you know, I think everybody would agree um, that she's been doing um, a tremendous job and that she is much more of an acting acting commissioner that active active commissioner than previous folks in that post given you know her long tenure at the agency and the number of um, leadership positions that she's held which we know about um, I just saw on Twitter this morning that she has now succeeded Rob Califf's first tenure and next month will surpass Stephen Hans so that's a wow um, you know, on the one hand, I think you could argue that benign neglect is better than the alternative for FDA, but has been so curious to me, as I'm sure all of you, that we have not to have a confirmed commissioner for so long, especially during um, the pandemic. I just do want to note that we just heard this week that um, Grail Sipes, who is the CEDAR um, Deputy Director for Regulatory Policy, will be taking on a new role in the White House Office of um, Science and Technology under Eric Lander, and that should perhaps improve communications and, and give FDA a higher profile um, and maybe an important advocate within the administration after I think we all can agree has been a very hands-off start to the new presidency. Um, and then Tim, to your point just about, you know, crystal balls, you know, I think we're all probably thinking that it's more likely than not that Rob Califf eventually gets through, but um, right now, it, he doesn't have the votes, and um, the White House seems to be backing off a little bit, um, which shouldn't be surprising given the history uh, and, of getting to where we are. Um, I saw it was characterized on Twitter this morning as, as you know, he's pretty much running a one-man PR show. So it's getting iffier by the minute. Um, that is a yow, and as Tim said, a possibility of a holy cow. Well, let me, Kate, let me pick up with that on accelerated approval, you know, as, as Zam is asking us to speak yeah. to in, in addition. So uh, that with respect to accelerated approval, I had a major hand in Sarepta's Ateplison. Obviously, Rob Califf had a hand in that during his prior tenure because that uh, decision by Dr. Woodcock was appealed uh, by Ellis Unger, and it went up to Rob Califf, who deferred saying he didn't, didn't think it was appropriate for a political appointee to have a position on this. And so he, he let others uh, handle the appeal, but he's certainly familiar with it. Now with Adjahelm, and I know we're gonna get, Zan said, we're gonna talk about that in more detail, but I'm just gonna stick to accelerated approval. There's a lot of congressional interest as to what to do on accelerated approval. For instance, I'm chairing a panel before the Congressional Caucus on Rare Diseases on February 22nd. That, that they've asked me, and one of those co-chairs is Amy Klobuchar of that group, has asked me to speak to Accelerate Proof, put together a panel. I brought Ellis Unger, who retired from the FDA in August, had been a cardiologist at NIH, 30 years at FDA, very respected, and a key player on accelerated approval, not only on Sarepta's Teplerson in 2015, but he was there during the Adjahelm. He's, he's made decisions to approve things recommendations to the contrary by his subordinates, like Dr. Stockbridge had recommended that he not do accelerate approval for Chelsea's Northera, Droxidopa for orthostatic hypotension, but Ellis chose to approve it by accelerate approval. So Ellis is gonna be on that panel. What are the things we're gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about how do we expand FDA's authority to be able to withdraw an approval? It's one of the sticking points that I perceive in all my interactions. I mean, I had an FDA meeting yesterday. I had one the day before. I have one Monday, Tuesday. I'm always inside the FDA. And in those meetings, I get the sense when an accelerated approval comes up that the FDA officials are worried that the study might not be done or the results might be negative. And it might be difficult to withdraw then the approval as they're struggling with now with McKenna. So 
I think one thing to address will be what is FDA's authority to be able to swiftly withdraw approval if the studies are negative. Second thing is how do you define reasonably likely to predict? And that's the linchpin to that. And I'm not going to steal Dr. Unger's thunder. He's told me what he has in mind. And I think I think Kate uh, Pink Sheet is going to follow that. So if, uh, watch your pink sheet on February 23rd. Because so so we'll have news coming out of that. So I think that there will be things that uh, Rob Califf, if confirmed within the realm of accelerated approval, he's going to be asked to opine on some of these things that could make major changes. Remember what Dave said about one quarter of all the novel approvals last year were accelerated approval. So this is it, it's it's an important feature of the regulatory pathway or armamentarium to be able to get through the pre-approval gauntlet. So if we can be strengthened so that it is used more frequently, it's more attractive within the FDA to employ accelerated approval, I, I think if Congress can make those kind of changes, we could actually enhance or ex accelerate the path to accelerated approval. So Zan, turning it back to you. Well, Frank and Kate, spectacular. And back to you, Tim, to wrap up here. Can I, you know what, Sam, do you mind if I pop in and just yeah, say a couple of things on accelerated approval? Because we've been following this a lot and we could spend the whole time talking about this, frankly, because this yep. is a big topic on the drug side and uh, and the, and is getting a lot of attention um, from a lot of different, uh, uh, different quarters. So, you know, I think it's also important to remember that when we talk about accelerated approval, there's oncology, and then there's everything else, right? So the vast majority of accelerated approvals are in oncology. The Oncology Center for Excellence is incredibly proficient and comfortable, and their advisory committees are comfortable in using that pathway. Um, you know, I, some, some um, you know, it, there's, and, and then as, as, uh, as Frank mentioned, there's been a lot of movement on regulatory policy um, with a lot more to come. And in 2021, we saw Rick Pazder really start to crack down on what he called delinquent or um, dangling uh, accelerated approvals in oncology where confirmatory trials either hadn't started or they were way behind schedule or they failed to confirm benefit. And so, um, so here's a wow, more than a dozen indications last year had been removed either following um, a negative advisory committee review or uh, response to, um, in response to a threat of one. Um, you know, Rick has said, once sponsors see all the issues laid out in those advisory committee documents, they get a little um, nervous and they start, and that's where you start to also see pulling some indications. So I would say up until this week, I would have said that um, Rick Pazder was 100% successful in all of his arm twisting. Um, and then we heard that um, oncopeptides announced they would actually on second thought challenge FDA's request to remove Pepaxto um, for multiple myeloma. And now it looks like that probably is going to, that was supposed to be an advisory committee last fall, late last year, got postponed or canceled because the sponsor agreed to pull the indication. And now it's probably um, likely heading back to an advisory committee. So that'll be one um, that will be worth popping the popcorn on. Um, you know, I think looking ahead in the near term, we're going to start seeing reviews of dangling or delinquent accelerator approvals as a routine topic of the Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee. Um, further out, there's certainly um, some potential for significant changes to the pathway. Um, it, I'm excited to hear what Ellis has to say about that. I know Rick certainly has some ideas. Um, but at the very least, you know, oncology regulators have been sending a very pointed message that sponsors, and we saw it twice this week already, need to have a workable plan for confirmatory studies at the time of accelerated approval or they're not gonna get it. And that is a big, big change from what we had been seeing. Um, I think, you know, FDA and Rick Pazder specifically would love to see, Frank, as you mentioned, um, a much easier path to, re to uh, remove indications where their benefit wasn't confirmed. He's also talking about simplifying the accelerate, the, uh, all of the expedited pathways. No one understands this pathway outside of oncology and FDA. I, I, and we're, we saw that in neurology with Adjahelm, and that was part of the problem is that um, and I know we're going to talk about this, but that advisory committee was not ready for that discussion. Um, so, you know, all of this dangling, delinquent, um, you know, uh, removals um, are really part of Rick Pazder's way to try to rebuild confidence in that pathway because he does not want outsiders like Congress um, to define it 
for FDA unless it's an idea that he has himself. Great insights. <laughs> and Tim, back to you for closing comments. Great. I, I would just say for those uh, of our colleagues online who wish to see more on this topic, Friends of Cancer Research has an exceptional website and it, you know, it, it's a glowing testimony to the success of accelerated approval in oncology for sure. But let me close with a yow on one other FDA matter, which is the tsunami of COVID uh, INDs for therapies and vaccines, which have overwhelmed the review division. We're seeing over a thousand of those. And I would wager over 95% will not be completed or result in any public benefit. So, you know, it's like watching six-year-old kids playing soccer, that the ball gets kicked around a lot, but no progress toward the goal. So some way we would hope that Dr. Kayla or others will help us marshal our public health intent there. And with that, I uh, just throw the ball back to you, Zan, and we can talk about COVID infected trials, manufacturing inspections, other important things in this domain. Yeah, well, that's a great segue into our next uh, session on impact of COVID. And Kate, I think, has coined the term COVID-infected trials. I love it. And uh, you ought to copyright it, Kate. Well, why, don't you, uh, yeah. why don't you lead off? <laughs> OK. I can't take credit for that. That's a, uh, But that is a term that we at Provision Policy uh, started kicking around early in the, in the pandemic. Um, when FDA issued what has turned out to be a series of, of really detailed and great guidance documents um, outlining um, flexibility in clinical trial uh, assessments to ensure patient safety um, while minimizing the risk of trial um, integrity during the pandemic. And I think you know, the, the potential issues of COVID infected trials uh, are really well known, potential quarantines, uh, sites, you know, clinical, um, study site closures, travel limitations, interruptions to the supply chain, just COVID-19 infection um, in patients and, and clinical investigators. And so I think industry has done, a, has done a, a good job at sort of working through some of those issues with FDA early on. The uh, agency had said it would be flexible on it, but it was really inevitable that we would start to see the result of these infected trials in product reviews. And we're, we're seeing those now. Um, and I think, um, you know, Frank and I were talking um, during the, the, our, you know, warm up to this um, and prepping for it, that there have been a couple of recent advisory committees um, for rare diseases, one in um, Prater Willey and one in Alport syndrome, where clinical trials were impacted by COVID and it was a topic of advisory committee discussion. Both um, were failed applications with pivotal studies that were impacted by um, corona in ways that complicated the efficacy analysis. So the question in my mind, and Frank may disagree with me and I would welcome that, um, is whether it was the primary reason. So, you know, in the case of the of Crater Willie, for example, I would, you know, you could argue that the sponsor had enough subjects to show it had to stop early because of um, enrollment issues due to the yeah. pandemic but that the sponsor had enough, spon had enough subjects to show an effect if it wanted to, if there was one. So for me, I think it, you know, the jury is still a little bit out on um, how flexible FDA will be on these clinical trials that ran during those very disruptive first months of the pandemic. But sooner or later, there is going to be an application where COVID infective trials is the underlying review issue um, and then one that we flagged is um, TG has a pending BLA for a novel um, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody um, that's codenamed U2, it's um, ublituximab. Um, and the sponsor is arguing that the, an imbalance in mortality that was seen um, in clinical trials with CLL patients um, favoring the, comp the comparator was driven by COVID deaths. And so um, the monoclonal antibody, they, I think they had some pre, um, uh, progression-free survival results that were positive in an early analysis, but it showed an imbalance in overall survival. That I think will be the subject of an advisory committee meeting this spring, and we're going to start to hear a little bit more about um, that. That in, that could be an an, um, an instance where where those COVID-infected trials um, directly impacted. Uh, the chances of the application getting through FDA. But and Kate, I, Kate, I was just gonna comment. I'm just gonna, cause you said those two and those were the two advisory committees. I was involved in both. 
And so just to the audience understands context, you know, here, Prader Willi, I won't go into how terrible the disease is, and, but, but they had projected, and I forget the exact numbers, but let's say 220 subjects they were going to enroll. Well, they actually had to stop because of COVID at about 180. And then if they, they did a cutoff and they pre-specified before they looked at the data, that they were going to cut it off as of March, 2020, because they know that children with Prader Willi are, it's a psychiatric condition and they're very, they're like autism. Routine is essential. And so as you're trying to evaluate children whose routines have been dramatically upended, all of us have, but especially to somebody who's really sensitive to that. And so they pro prospectively said, we're going to cut off the analysis before we know the results as of March 2020, which meant they would have had maybe 120 subjects. So when that cohort came through positive, but it wasn't the ITT because they had really done 180. So they had these other things. Well, that contaminated. They then lost the effect. And, and of course, they never got to the 220 because of COVID. So your phrase, COVID infected trials, and your prediction that, that we're going to see more and more of difficult decisions of how to cope with this and manage and make accommodation for it in a scientifically rational way so that all of this research is not lost. It's certainly confounded, but we, we want to be able to salvage it in a way that's going to advance public health. So agree. Great, Frank. Kate, back to a few words about manufacturing inspections. Yes. Um, so um, thank you, Zan. So, so coming out of, um, of this pandemic, um, the next commissioner is going to have to oversee a major catch up and inspections. And I, I mean, I would say this is probably the single biggest management challenge for FDA in the next 12 months. Um, and I don't, it hasn't been given a lot of air or attention um, on the Hill. I mean, maybe a little bit recently, but there would be, you know, full hearings where this subject did not come up at all. Um, so, you know, the, I think it's, it's um, top line is that, you know, the, the um, ongoing pandemic continues to delay approvals. Um, in 2021, there were 60 applications, um, 52 of which I think were drugs um, that were held up due to an inability to conduct pre-approval pre inspections. And two of those were mission critical drugs. So some of these are important applications um, that are being delayed. You know, I think what we're seeing um, we're on the domestic side over the last two fiscal years, FDA has only been able to complete about half its normal domestic visits and really a small fraction of the overseas inspections. And so, you know, while overseas inspections have pretty much been on hold um, since March of 2020, with some exceptions, um, FDA had, had um, uh, resumed its normal schedule um, domestically in July, but then right before the new year, very quietly uh, announced mission critical inspections in the US um, first, through uh, January 19th. And now I think they just extended it to February 4th. So, you know, the goal is to return at least in the US to a normal cadence of inspections by April, but that's totally dependent on what this um, virus does next. And, you know, I think we all agree that anyone that has any ideas on that is, is you know, lying to you because we don't know where this is headed. But, um, and so due to this complete, almost complete inability to conduct overseas inspections in countries like China and India, um, FDA has been relying on its uh, European partners and these remote assessments. And industry has been really excited about the potential for remote assessments. assessments. And that can be you know, record review or even virtual sort of technology enabled inspections, including the possibility of maybe carrying those over to post pandemic times as a, as a key lesson learned of how to make the process more efficient. FDA doesn't think it's more efficient um, and they've made it clear that they're really not a replacement for in-person visits. Um, and they've also been clear that remote um, record reviews are not inspections. They're very careful to call them assessments. Um, and they've been pretty much generally, um, unless people are hearing something different, lukewarm to the idea that they would do anything more than really supplement in-person visits. Um, which remains the gold standard. So this is a problem. It's going to continue. It's certainly a management challenge for whoever's coming in um, to FDA in the commissioner's office. Great. And very quickly, how about transitions from EUA to full approvals? And Frank, Kellyanne, and Kate can uh, 
can take that on. Go ahead, Kate, since you've got the floor. Um, you know, I, I, I'm gonna let Frank lead on this one. Um, the only thing that I would say is that two years ago, no one would have been able to explain what an EUA was. I certainly wouldn't have. And now there's a lot of understandable interest in this pathway. Um, and what we're starting to see now, which I think is so interesting, is some increased pressure from stakeholders to use the emergency use authorization pathway for non-pandemic applications, um, which I know is not exactly what you're talking about, but I find it so interesting that I'm gonna shoehorn it in here anyway. So, you know, folks have started to make the case that um, ALS and treatments and opioid um, addiction um, products are, are far more fatal than COVID-19 and could also be deemed public health emergencies. And so mm -hmm. FDA, I think it's kind of shut that down pretty quickly, but it's creating some noise on Capitol Hill and it's worth mentioning. Great point, Frank. I was on mute. Uh, can I pick up on that? Because I had a colloquy. I raised that question with Peter Marks in May before in a Vatican uh, international health conference. And I says, you know, given your experience with COVID and your experience with UA, the EUA, what about if Congress were to declare rare diseases, given there are 7,000 of them, and at the rate at which we're approving them, it's, it's going to be another 200 years before we have one for everyone. So it, it, wouldn't you think that rare disease development is also a public health emergency and if we had that declaration you know where would that go because it the standard then would become whether the known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks now maybe it doesn't apply to all rare diseases but maybe those that we call ultra rare those with under ten thousand, where it's really difficult to do studies so i i i'll i'll, I'll speak for you too right kate both of us have been talking too much. So in the issue Zan wanted us to talk to, I'm going to turn to Kellyanne, talk about transitioning EUAs to full approvals. Sure. Kellyanne. Sure. Yeah, well, I can talk about that from the device side because CDRH has issued a guidance document kind of outlining a phased approach for people with EUAs, uh, devices under enforcement, you know, discretion policies at FDA. And so it's not final, but, um, and it does give a phased approach, like I said, like once they revoke, you know, an EUA or a guidance document, and then there's 180 days, you know, when you come in. So there's this whole plan that they lay out and they do want sponsors if they plan to stay on the market to come to FDA, you know, and tell them about their plan to, to stay on the market or their plan to withdraw from the market. And they lay out some exceptions for you know, single use devices, you know, out on the market for X number of period. So there is a plan and I know sponsors are starting to look at their data and, and see, you know, okay, do we have enough to support a full marketing authorization and, and hence like the biofire, for example, and the COVID kind of lays out at least, you know, a roadmap for, for folks that want to keep their, their tests on the market. Um, so, so they're talking about it. They're starting to talk about the phased approach and what that will look like and what will remain under enforcement discretion or not. Um, you know, I know there was a question with regard to, you know, the psychiatric, you know, devices on the market and there's been no formal update, but they, all these enforcement discretion policies sort of fall under this general draft guidance that FDA has issued for the transition of um, EUAs and COVID related products on the market. So that's where devices stand for now. There's no clear timeline on that at this point. That's terrific. And let's go to Ajahem which um, we're going to try <laughs> to not beat a dead horse. But before we do, I just want to put Karen on notice that we want to bring you up after that session, uh, because I can see we're not going to get through our, our uh, complete script. And uh, we'd like to get uh, Sifsan in there before we, uh, we end up. But back to Ajahem, what more is there to say? Um, a lot of, yeah. uh, we've already talked about it several times. Most recently, we, we had the CMS uh, decision on uh, pavement, which is highly unusual and, and controversial. So uh, what, do you, what do you say, Frank? What, well, what here's what I have to say. You know, it, the benefit of having a gray beard is you have perspective. And, you know, when, when it was the FDA's Genius. Even though we had patient advocates like ACT UP, you know, urging the FDA to do more during the AIDS crisis, 
It was FDA's genius. It wasn't industry or Congress or academia or even the patient voice who said you should adopt this new pathway. It was the FDA on its own sua sponte. And I'd say primarily Bob Temple. I'm going to give Bob credit for it because I sat around the commission's room, conference room table, and I was the young scribe asked to write this all down and figure it out. And, and so that, that accelerated approval pathway that FDA created on its own initiative transformed, had the effect of after the first approvals, it, it generated more approvals and quickly we transformed a death sentence into a chronic disease. Janet Woodcock has been quoted this fall when she kept being asked, hasn't the FDA lowered its standards because of Adjahelm? Haven't you lowered the standards? And Janet got exacerbated at one point and said, no, if anybody lowered the standards, we lowered them with HIV and I lowered them with beta serum. When I approved the first drug for MS under accelerated approval, that is not cancer, not AIDS, I approved the first one not for cancer or AIDS, it was beta serum, the first drug for MS. And now today, because of that generated so much more excitement and, and follow-up research and activity, there are 17 FDA approved drugs for multiple sclerosis. You know, after the first one came through, I'm not, I don't know what Teplerson, I helped in 2015 on the accelerated approved, very controversial, Sereptis for DMD. That was the first drug approved for DMD. There are three more drugs for genetic specific DMD. So there's four, like if I count a Teplerson, plus there's a corticosteroid in Flaza. So since 2015, after that controversial approval, just like maybe beta serum was controversial, but look what it led to. Look what... society to say that maybe Adjahelm, you know, there have been decades of very vigorous research on Alzheimer's that has been unproductive, I would say more fun. And now we have Adjahelm come through. I'm going to predict, and you can mark this, Zan, that in five to 10 years, just when we look back, what happened to AIDS after the accelerated approval? What happened to MS after accelerated approval? Look what's happening in DMD. I'm going to predict that in five years, we're going to look back and say, look, we finally had a path forward to a disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's. And I, so I don't, there are many people, it's very easy to castigate the decision, rip it apart and stuff. I'm, I would hold my powder, keep it dry because my experience teaches me that we might have done a lot more good, just like we did with AIDS, MS, DMD. And, and I can see into the future, and I would predict if I could go to Vegas and put money on this, <laughs> that this will this will have been a transformative moment too. Wow, uh, Frank, that Jesuit education has made you a great master of rhetoric. <laughs> so thank you for that gutsy uh, prediction. Uh, any other comments? Uh, David, anything uh, on Adjahem from your corner? Um, well, three, 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 three points. I, I think what we're really talking about here is the, the trade-off between uncertainty and unmet need. And, and this is all really a, a, a policy decision for the community. How much uncertainty are we, we willing to accept in order to meet an unmet need? Um, and I think, you know, we need more discussion, I think, around the policy concept than around the science. I think we tend to think that this is, can be reduced to some kind of scientific algorithm, but it's really a community decision about, are we willing to accept um, you know, a, a pretty significant level of uncertainty as to the, the end point, the, the quantity and quality of the data, uh, because there is an unmet need. And how much are we willing to put into the, you know, the, the laps of the, the patients, their families and the providers? And that's ultimately a policy decision. Um, second, uh, you know, I think there's an apocryphal story about how accelerated approval got to be named accelerated approval. It was originally, I think, titled in FDA's uh, draft of the rule, conditional approval, and the White House sent it back. It was rebranded as accelerated approval, and then it sailed through. I, I, I think what we're really talking about today, it, it, it's conditional approval. I mean, I think the cat's out of the bag, and I think we need to go back and look at how we could put more conditions on these approvals expressly, like what Kate, Kate was talking about. 
you know, an approval package that 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 requires periodic, um, you know, re rechecks of, of the product and 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 a, and a defined schedule and standards for setting a schedule on this on the on the studies on which the product, the approval was conditioned, and then last, I just always worry as as an FDA or um, you know about about FDA overcorrecting here, in response to Adam Helm and, and and trying to show that yeah it's not an easy mark, and so tightening up on other products. So I always look for that. Sam, uh, please, Tim, go right ahead. Just a brief comment here as well. I love Frank's characterization: one small step for man and a giant step for those various disease states. But I think in order to help us uh, further progress rare disease development, we need to figure out how not to be captives of the p-value hex, and also how we can better develop simulated controls. Yeah, well, speaking of statistics, Adjahem failed mightily on, one of its, uh, on its primary endpoint for one pivotal trial. So um, uh, we have to look at the particulars here and we could beat this to death. But Kate, why don't you give us the, uh, the high level view and what Congress is gonna have to say ultimately here? Oh, I wish I knew I'd be uh, <laughs> a lot um, more successful than I am if I had that kind of crystal ball. You know, I think, um, I think the big question on this, at least in, um, in my mind is, you know, CMS, that just that proposed um, decision, you know, to overrule FDA, uh, I think was a holy cow um, moment um, in, in the early part of this year. And, um, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of things you can say about, about Agihelm. I think it was probably mishandled from the start. Um, sorry, Billy, uh, you know, it, this was an advisory committee that doesn't understand that process. They probably should have gone back after they decided, um, you know, to use that pathway even after telling everybody that they weren't going to. Um, but I think the big question is, is this a trend um, on, the, on the CMS side? And, and what does this mean for the future of, of, um, of, of research in this area? So Frank, I found your very optimistic, um, I liked your very optimistic prediction. Um, and I would add to that by just saying, I think we have to be careful about reading too much into CMS's decision. Um, you know, this was, you know, Rick Pazder told me he thought this was a great use of accelerated approval and that he um, has been on the record saying that he thought he encouraged them to Billy Dunn to, to use it. Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons why um, this could be different. I mean, normally accelerated approval is used in a narrow um, patient, um, you know, um, population, uh, oncology indications, targeted therapies. This was a very broad label, which was also kind of um, amazing and a, a super wow. Um, and it was it would have a very broad reach, and so I think that's why you're seeing why you saw CMS respond the way that they did. Um, I don't know what it means for the future of um, of Alzheimer's disease development, but I like Frank's uh, I like Frank's um, uh, uh, predictions. And the last thing I'll say about accelerated approval is that and Agilehelm is that criticisms about AA are usually criticisms about drug pricing. Like this was going to be an expensive product. It was gonna blow everybody's budget. And that's why everybody was so worried about it. Great, Kate. Well, we have done Ajahem. Let's go on to uh, CIFSAN and would love to have your, your coverage, Karen. Great, so I'm gonna to touch on um, two things uh, real brief. Uh, the first is something that FDA has said we should watch out for and look out for. Uh, which is last June, they announced um, that they intended to issue draft guidance on labeling of plant-based milk alternatives. Uh, you may recall uh, Scott Gottlieb famously saying almonds don't lactate. Well, this is where the rubber is going to meet the road on that. Uh, and the issue of the modernization of standards of identity and whether you can call almond milk milk or not. So um, I look forward to that guidance to see what their draft guidance, I should say, to see kind of where they're going with this modernization and just kind of how aggressive and modern they're going to be with it and how much they're going to take uh, kind of consumer sentiments and uh, understanding into consideration in this. So that's uh, the first thing we're going to look out for. The second thing is 
uh, something that industry is uh, just screaming out for, but I think is unlikely to happen, which is any guidance on CBD. Um, uh, just this past August, FDA reiterated in um, response to Charlotte Webb's, Charlotte Webb Holdings uh, that hemp extract, hemp ex, God, I can't speak anymore. Hemp extract can't be used in dietary supplements, of course, because the term dietary supplement excludes ingredients or items that have been approved as a new drug, see Epidiolex. Um, so I think while um, cannabis as a whole from a government affairs perspective has never looked, uh, it hasn't looked rosier. You've got Democrats in the White House, you got Democrats leading in Congress. Um, however, years gone by and not a single cannabis related uh, piece of legislation has landed on the president's desk for signing. So um, I think the time for any activity on that front is, is uh, that window is closing very quickly. Um, and so they FDA, need a joint committee? Pardon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there's... I, knew, I knew you'd come through. <laughs> <laughs> so it, an FDA is not going to take any steps on CBD until they have that federal uh, 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 legislation in place that allows them to do that. So while the industry is screaming and it's huge, um, uh, and meaning the CBD and in beverages and in dietary supplements, and we all see it out there, um, FDA is still holding the line that that is illegal. It is adulterated product. Um, and uh, my crystal ball, or more likely the magic eight ball, uh, is saying that we're not going to see anything in, in the uh, coming year or so on that, at least. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Dan. Terrific. Thank you so much. Karen, why don't we go to Orphan uh, Product Watch with uh, two preeminent experts, Dave Fox and Frank Sazanowski. Well, th well th thanks, Dan. I'll, I'll, I'll kick this off on the, the, the more prosaic legal side, which, which is um, the, bi the big news in 2021 was FDA's loss of the Catalyst case in the 11th Circuit. Um, that, that case very briefly had to do with the scope of orphan exclusivity. And it's been FDA's position since the almost the inception of the orphan program, or at least since the regu regulations were finalized in the early 1990s, that your orphan exclusivity is based on the indication that you receive. So it's not the general disease, but it's how you propose to treat the disease and in what population that defines your seven year period of orphan exclusivity. And the 11th Circuit struck that down effectively negated FDA's longstanding regulation and said, no, 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 go back to the statute. The statute says you get seven years of exclusivity for the disease or condition. And that's a pretty remarkable wow, holy cow, um, because essentially it says that for the particular drug for which you have orphan designation, if you get approval, you own that disease for that drug for seven years. Um, the, the court, didn't even talk about the regulation. They didn't even dignify FDA's regulation. Um, and the court, interestingly enough, the panel was led by Judge Lagoa, who was the runner up for a Supreme Court nominee that uh, Amy Coney Barrett got. So it was a, a, another example of a, a judicial ideology uh, meeting FDA and squashing FDA. Um, so there's a very, very interesting kind of legal ripple effects to, to what it means when, when courts like the 11th Circuit, like this panel, um, essentially are compelling FDA to regulate directly from the statute, never mind your nice regulations that you took so long to, to adopt. Um, so, uh, you know, the question is now is, is FDA going to amend its regulations? Are they going to instigate some kind of an amendment? Uh, uh, to the Orphan Drug Act, um, you know, or uh, last, it's possible that the um, the company Jacobus, who is on the receiving end of this and is going to have their orphan approval or their drug approval rescinded, is going to get a hearing at the Supreme Court level. Um, FDA has not been pushing for a hearing, but but the sponsor whose product is about to be approved, excuse me, rescinded because they're now blocked by the first sponsor's exclusivity may get a hearing at the Supreme Court, we'll see. 
and, and, and that, Frank, I don't know if Frank wanted to jump in here. Frank, we're, we're talking about your favorite subject. I, I, I know, and I, I, helped, lost, I, know yeah, I helped I helped Catalyst get its approval for LEM, so I'm not going to step into the Catalyst case. But what I want to do is, and remember, David just talking about the implementing regulations. I know who drafted them. When I look in the mirror, I know that guy. And, and so I've been around the world of orphans for a long time, and I'm about to tell all of you on this call the greatest wow in the history of orphan drugs. Wow. So you ready? Here it is. There are two ways that the FDA has always said you can get drugs approved. The 1962 amendment said you have to have adequate well control studies. The FDA has interpreted it to be two adequate well control studies. Remember, Tim talked about the P of 0.05. So two studies that both hit P of less than 0.05, primary endpoint, pre-specified primary analysis, and primary analysis population. Really tough in the world of orphans. Almost never happens. So the other way is that in May 1998, the FDA came out with the guidance document on clinical evidence of effectiveness, in which they said, you know, sometimes if you have one highly persuasive statistical test, that is one study that had a p-value of, let's say, p of 0.001, then maybe we can count that as though it's two. And, and the endpoint should have been something like irreversible morbidity and mortality so that it would be unethical to run a replicate, a second study. That's very hard to do. So it makes it really hard to develop therapies for rare diseases. 1997, there was a third path to approval, which was called an alternative. It was FADAMA 115, the FDA Modernization Act, which said one adequate well control study with confirmatory evidence. There's only been one workshop on that, done by Carl Peck, who had left the FDA in 95. He's seen as the father of this. And it turns out, I've been harping on the FDA to my friends, Janet Woodcock and Bob Temple, since 1997. You've got to come out with a new guidance on this. Finally, in December 2019, the guidance came out, and the FDA gave examples of how to do confirm one study with a normal P of less than 0.05 and confirmatory evidence, which could be even things like mechanistic information, you know, an animal model study, you know, much more doable for rare disease. Fast forward. Nobody at the FDA seemed to pay attention to it until there must have been an in-house training in the second quarter of 2021. Because starting in about May or June, I started seeing in all my clients language, even at pre-IND meetings, where FDA was telling sponsors, if you're going to come in with one adequate and well-controlled study, you better start thinking now how you're going to come up with confirmatory evidence. Wow, it's mind-blowing. And then there are two FDA approvals this fall. In September, the FDA approved uh, the, a drug for a client of mine, Miram's Lamarley for uh, Liv Marley for a liver disease. Um, and the FDA explicitly said, yes, you have one study, but you know what? You've got this confirmatory evidence. You can look at mechanistic information. You can look at natural history. And they approved the drug I mentioned a little bit ago, Seber, the Rithemic in October of 2020. So we had examples of therapies that the FDA was calling out for orphans that they were getting approved on the basis of a single study with a P of 0.05, but confirmatory evidence. So this is huge because it could be transformative for the whole field of, de of developing therapies for our sisters and brothers who are afflicted with rare conditions. So I wanted to, as we're running out of time, and on a huge wow for people. Well, thank you, Frank. That, that is quite amazing. And we are running out of time. Let's go over to CDRH and Kellyanne, Minnie, uh, Dave Fox. Uh, let's do a jump ball here. Let's start with some of your major thoughts. Yeah, I'm happy to start. For, for CDRH, I'll say something I see day in and day out lately is the discussion and negotiation uh, um, for machine learning, AI, um, digital health products uh, to develop what are called predetermined change control plans um, comes out of the white paper for machine learning. But, but, but essentially, FDA is trying to um, establish special controls, a lot of times through the de novo pathway. 
that then allow manufacturers of such devices to make modifications to those machine learning type devices without coming back to FDA every single time, right? So putting guardrails around how much retraining can be done, what modifications can be made um, in the field, and when exactly they will come back to FDA for a new submission. So it, it's a pretty popular topic. There's not a lot of them that have gotten through FDA yet. There's a couple. Um, but people are continuing down this path and trying to figure out how this is going to help, especially in the world of machine learning where things are changing so quickly and kind of maybe not so in line with FDA's regulatory process. So very quickly, um, Madoof, uh, CDRH missed its Madufa uh, target date and all of the other UFAs um, met their target dates. So it's unfortunate. The, the negotiations continue in the Center for Devices and the industry, um, but that's always been sort of a bumpy road, but it's something to keep an eye on. And David, how about the uh, Genus Medical case? Um, kind of ho-hum at this point, Lot, lots to, you know, uh, interesting road ahead where FDA is going to have to move some products that historically regulated as drugs over to devices. So now it has to pick through and figure out which ones. I think, you know, it's focused on contrast agents. That's what the case was about. But um, I think the interesting issue is what about other products like skin protection, protectants and sunscreens and things that work by physical means that have historically been regulated as drugs? Are we going to see a seismic change in, in the regulation of categories of products like that? A um, couple of quick wrap up, wrap, wrap up points and a few things that interesting. I heard the phrase arsenic in rice cereals, <laughs> <laughs> which is something I need to digest. Um, sorry, Tim. Um, but the other one I, I heard was virtual reality for pain. And I have to say, I, I, this, this is a, Frank had his giant wow. I mean, this is the, the giant wow that I, I really want to learn more about. But this idea of CDRH approving um, cognitive behavioral therapy for depression, irritable bowel. Um, I, I saw recently vi video games for, for also for pain and other you know neurological issues, and then you have you know cedar on the other side with it, its own standards and the lack of kind of harmonization here, and the potential for the, for the individual centers and the staff within the centers to go in different directions on these you know major critical therapeutic areas. I, I find you know both somewhat concerning, but I'm also hugely optimistic that this is just a whole new gateway to therapy. Um, so I'm very, very excited about it, but I, I worry about it being pushed through at the individual center level and at the individual staff level without coordination. But the therapeutic metaverse is, is, is my big wow. And Kellyanne, what about your thoughts on digital technology? Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised every day by what I see come across my desk as far as, you know, video games, like I said, for ADHD and, and virtual reality for pain. And, you know, I mean, every day it's a new it's a new digital health application, especially, like I said, in that, that neurological space and this cognitive behavioral therapy and allowing people to do that from home and putting them in virtual settings that, you know, will allow them to have that therapy at home. So, um, yeah, I'm just seeing a lot of it. Voice detection for various different indications. Um, you know, it, every day it's kind of a learning process. So I, I only expect there to be a lot more de novos in this space and a lot more indications in, in this area. And many turning to you, we, we mentioned the impact of COVID on meetings uh, and other uh, tasks at, at CDRH. What, what is your prognostication there? Where, where are we going? And maybe we could expand to, to uh, all the uh, centers. What, what are we going to see in the future about communication of sponsors with FDA? Yeah, well, I'll focus on CDRH uh, because there's there are data and acknowledgments that, that there have been delays and uh, and being able to meet the uh, Medufa uh, guidelines around when um, a Q sub would be held, when the response would happen, and those kinds of things. And so I think what you will hear from Jeff Shuren is an acknowledgement of this, and 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 good for him for acknowledging that 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 is the case, and and laying out what he anticipates to be 
uh, a pathway for improvement, which he anticipates in 2022, early 2022, we would start to see um, an improvement in being able to meet the goals and deadlines that CDRH has set forth. And others chime in here. Are we talking about um, uh, virtual reality? Are we headed to a metaverse of virtual everything uh, at FDA? And uh, to the extent possible, virtual advisory committee meetings and, and everything else. What do you think, David? Yeah, well, I, 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 I... There's no profit in trying to predict the future in this regard, but what, what the new normal or the new abnormal is going to be. But when you look at uh, Padupa 7, that's you know coming around the corner and the introduction of now Part D, or excuse me, Type D meetings, uh, as well as pre-pre-IND interact meetings at CEDAR. And you look at more meetings being added to the, the, the CEDAR suite, and then you look at the trend in advisory committees going down. I mean, and, and then the abundance of written response only um, uh, uh, approaches for most, you know, many meeting requests. It, it just does not seem like FDA is going back soon to an in-person, you know, pre pre-COVID business as, as it was environment. The idea that you would be able to get all the people. At, at White Oak at the same time, just it, it just seems, you know, it's just beyond my imagination. So, what you know, I, I think that maybe maybe the next step is for is for FDA to to open the door to more um, of these types of virtual meetings where we actually can see people because most of the meetings I've been attending have, have been uh, phone, you know teleconference only. And then last, I, I have the same worry. I think that everybody else worries about is. It's not so much about the the old people like us, but it's 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 how FDA is going to train the new people in running meetings and exercising judgment. Um, and I and I really worry that that this kind of arm's length electronic environment is is not going to be very good in the long run, and it's going to, going to create too much distance for 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 the really difficult calls that have to be made, the real tough judgment calls. I mean, we always talk about. Dr. Unger and Dr. Temple and the people that, you know, Frank grew up with uh, and, and people that you and I grew up with, Zan, and, and it's hard to imagine what the future would look like if that kind of environment was not, an, you know, a more collaborative environment for, for bringing up new talent. So I, I, a big worry there. And Kate, Thank you. Uh, uh, just to say, Kate, you touched on that, the co corporate culture and being able to attract new blood, train them, um, how is this going to work? Yeah, it's it's uh, David agreed with everything you said. Um, I sort of predict, and I don't have any real direct knowledge. First of all, it's important to say that FDA really doesn't have a lot of its own, um, can't make its own decisions about whether it goes back, right? Like that's made up further up the um, up the uh, food chain in the administration. So timing of getting back to um, White Oak, um, it's hard for me to believe that building is just gonna stay empty forever. Um, at some point we gotta get back to our lives. So a couple of things just to piggyback off what David said. Um, I think it'll be a hybrid. I think for the lower level meetings, I think everyone agrees that they're so much more convenient. You don't wanna go to a type C meeting in White Oak and fly there and get your whole team there just you know, for something like that. That can be handled very easily over Zoom. Um, advisory committees have been a little spotty over Zoom. I would think that that would be one that we would start to see um, maybe going back into the great room and, um, and holding those there. As far as training is concerned, it's a problem. I mean, there are lots of new folks that are coming on and they're coming on knowing that they can work virtually. I think it's actually kind of a huge perk to the job um, and some, a selling point that FDA can have that you don't have to be in the office um, and drive uh, to White Oak five days a week. So that's gonna be a lot of strain there. I think there are gonna be some new folks that came on in this virtual environment that have never met their bosses. That's a problem when it comes to training. Um, so it's, um, it's another big management decision that the next commissioner is gonna have to face for sure. Yeah. So Zan, just a, a comment on this. I think one of the issues that has arisen as a result of the virtual environment 
is the lack of stimulus for collaboration. If you think way back, things like targeted product profile and so forth came out of shared industry agency discussions with the focus on public health, not on industry advantages or FDA efficiencies. And I think when we look at some of the things that are threatening in our environment, I'll use antimicrobial resistance as one example, we're not in a position to collaborate on those kinds of things. For, for those of you who read Lancet, the huge review on global burden of morbidity and mortality with antimicrobial resistance and, and the lack of uh, any appropriate programs for that collaboratively is deeply disturbing to me from my training background. I think we have impotent incentives and we need ways to deal with things like that. The next COVID, which may be bacterial, not viral or other threats. So I think it's an unfortunate virtual environment that discourages that. And by the way, what has happened to uh, collaboration with other authorities across the globe? We certainly need to be doing that. Um, and facing up to the pandemic, but what's happened to ICH and to the uh, Forum of Device um, Regulatory Authorities? What, how do we, what's gonna happen in the future uh, for regulatory collaboration across the globe? Anybody? <laughs> That's, you know, I'll, I'll bring up one really small example, and that is um, in the Oncology Center for Excellence, their Project Orbis um, uh, program, which where there are sort of parallel reviews with between the US and, um, and other um, regulatory agencies. There have been a, a number of uh, Australia, the UK, Israel, uh, Canada, I think. Um, that's been a huge um, initiative there. And I could see sometimes some of those programs that OCE seems to be rolling out once a week um, could be like Project Facilitate, which is for expanded access, which we haven't talked about, you know, to be used by um, some of the other um, divisions. But uh, China is one where, you know, I think, uh, you know, would, would love to join that um, Project Orbis um, uh, initiative in oncology, there are obviously a lot of issues around that. I think sponsors would like to see that too. So there's is that's just one small kind of um, co cooperation between FDA and other regulatory agencies. And then of course on the inspection side as well. But I think you were looking for a bigger picture than that, Sam. No, but that's a great example. And it, it again, it's an innovation out of the oncology office and not so much happening in other divisions that I'm aware of. Mm -mm. Not at all. Oh my gosh, we have gotten to the end of our appointed time. And I deeply regret that we don't have about two or three more hours, but uh, we're gonna to have to bring it to a close. We are going to make every effort to respond to great questions that have come in. We'll post those uh, when, uh, as soon as we can. And I hope that uh, this will be an ongoing conversation among our audience and our panelists. I can't thank our panelists enough. Just what an amazing discussion. And we did cover all the centers, but uh, we just didn't have enough time to, to do everything that we, we wanted. So thanks again to all of you for participating. And Thomas, over to you. I re-echo the thanks of Zen for the panelists and, and also to the audience, you the audience, for your uh, great commentary. Uh, and uh, at this stage, I think I would say uh, uh, have a good day and a great weekend. <laughs>